Yeah, for all who don't know, my name is Kyle Rain, the lead pastor at Eastside Baptist Church. I did break my ankle several weeks ago. I'm going to um, garnish your sympathy for many more weeks to come. So if you just thought this was a cool walk that the kids are doing these days, it's not. It's, uh, it's all me. Um, look, I, I want to talk about a few things real quick before we get started. Um, you know, I know a lot of us are out this weekend, but, but I felt like it was important to, to touch upon a few things. Number one, um, we have some exciting things coming up, and I don't mean to, <laughs> I'm not the minister of announcements, right? Okay, I'm not going to preach on this, I promise. But, but it, it, is, it is vitally important for me as a pastor that, that you know as a church the things that God has placed in our heart to care about. One of those things is orphan ministry and orphan care. Um, here at the end of August, uh, there is a kids' carnival uh, that is from this uh, group called One Hope, which, is, which a lot of pastors in the area get together and do. And um, there's a carnival that's going to be happening. I think, if I'm not mistaken, your bulletin says it's the last Saturday of the month. I think it's the 27th, 28th, something like that. Um, they've invited our church to come and hang out with uh, foster families and families of low income. Uh, they're going to be doing a huge carnival for them here in Springfield. Uh, they're giving away um, free su- school supplies, backpacks. And here's why I tell you this, because I know you can read that. And I, and, but it is important for me um, and my family and the leadership of this church to know that, that, that there, is, there is opportunity for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Now, this church serves well. We, we do a great job serving. But, but the kids and the families amongst us, uh, especially during these seasons. And, and I, we, were, we were out doing school supplies yesterday. That is the second coming. That is Armageddon. I don't know, have you, ever, have you been to Walmart yet? Have you walked in Walmart and seen the school supply? It's like mothers like, you know, just fighting each other for like the coolest pencil bag, you know, whatever. I remember the day where like you would go in and it was all boxed up for you, you didn't get a choice. Did anybody used to do that? No? Like you just walk in, it'd be boxed up for you. But anyway, like, I mean, someone tried to cut Cassie off now because she was afraid she was gonna get the last piece of, uh, you know, graph paper or something like that. I'm like, hey, look. And, um, and so the, the reality is this can be actually a very um, anxious time for our family, especially low-income families. Uh, their kids trying to get them off to school, get them on the right foot. Um, so I just, I just pray that, that you'll come out and, and help us with that. Secondly, um, and it's about kids too, and... Uh, we are starting a brand new program. It's an old program that's been going on for a long time, but it's brand new for our church called Awanas. Um, Awanas is in an amazing, amazing uh, uh, program where, where it's for kids from, I think, kindergarten all the way up to sixth grade. And it, it talks about the word and, and does scripture memory. Um, but here's the thing. It takes a lot of people to pull off Awanas, a lot of volunteers. And so Wednesday nights coming up in the fall, we're going to be doing Awanas. We are one of three churches in the area that are doing it, Okay. Um, and, and to be really honest with you, one of the churches may not do it again this fall. So um, it is a grand opportunity for us. We have several families that have participated in Awanas, love it. And so we just met last week with Twin Rivers Baptist Church and the person who directs their Awanas and they're helping us get it started. But here's one thing. I know, look, kids may frighten you. They frighten me, okay? <laughs> Those don't know, I have seven children, so I, that was the joke. But anyway... You'll get it tomorrow, it's great. Um, it's the pain meds that are kicking in right now. Um, so the thing is, the kids are our future in this church. You know, we, we can have, we can have the, a great worship and, and, and I can be really funny and good looking, check, check. But, but we gotta reach, the, we, gotta, we, we, we have to at our early age get our kids going in the right direction and present them Jesus. Because here's the thing, I don't wanna baptize your kid when they're 30. No, I'm not, I'm not kidding. I don't want to baptize your kid when they're 30. I do more 30-year-old baptisms than I do 13-year-old baptisms. You know why? Because for so long we have good church kids who come to church, but they don't know Jesus and they don't accept Christ and they wait till they're an adult and go, oh, I've been trying my entire life to get right with God, but you mean there's this Christ I've heard about this whole time and I have not believed. I thought just attending saved me. And I don't want that for you and I don't want that for them. And so look, I'm, 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 we're full court pressing this. Like we're all in for this Awanas program. Barb Cook, uh, the gal that was up here singing that's been doing our Wednesday night program, she's gonna be leading it still. We're super excited, we're all pumped, but we need you, we need volunteers. I don't care how old you are. It doesn't matter how old you are, how many kids or how little of kids you have. If you're frightened by kids, we'll just like, like, let you do rec or games or something like that, right? All right, or you can clean up. We don't have sign-up sheets for it yet. 
But if you wanna help, that connect card that you got today in your bulletin, just fill it, say, hey, Awanas. Just put a word Awanas there. We'll contact you and give you like 20 different jobs. It'll be great. Okay. So I just wanna put that out there and, and tell you that we're, we're excited about it and, um, and we want you to be excited about it too. Um, so we are in the book of Exodus. Uh, we have been here for several weeks now. Um, we have not, uh, as we usually do, go through line by line by line. We've actually taken just themes of Exodus and talked about it and unpacked it. And, and what we've found is this. Um, as we're walking through and watching God rescue his people out of slavery. Last week we talked about the parting of the Red Sea and how the people were able to go through on dry land and is a picture of God's restoring his people completely. Their enemies have been crushed by the waves and the wind, just like our sin is crushed by Jesus. And so this week we were kind of walking to our very last sermon for Exodus and we're gonna talk about two things. We're gonna look at briefly um, when the people were in the wilderness and manna came from heaven and the golden calf, okay? And, and look, I, I wish we had time to just break everything down and tell you exactly what's going on. But what I don't want you to miss is this, that you can see the gospel all throughout this book. You can see God's redemptive plan through Jesus playing out for the people of Israel, okay? This morning, what I really want to kind of address is that when you and I meet Jesus, when you and I are walking with Christ, there is what I think one of the greatest heart idols that we go after and that really the American church has really leaned into and that is the idol of comfort. And like I just talked about Awana, it is comfortable not to serve. But Jesus nowhere in the New Testament says, come all who are weary so you can be comfortable. He doesn't say that. In fact, we look at his disciples and those who were following Christ, all of them died for their faith. Jesus was a, following Jesus was a terrible retirement plan, okay? To follow Jesus and to serve Jesus means sacrifice. But in that sacrifice, there's joy. I, I don't know if you've ever been around, if you've ever helped out with kids ministry or done missions or anything like that, but when you are serving in Jesus' name, when you're being the hands of Jesus, whatever it is, I don't care what you're doing, there is something that happens with your spirit and the Holy Spirit that lines up and says, yes, this is good, this is right. We do not do things, we do not serve, we do not get out of our comfort zone because we are good people. In fact, the Bible says the very opposite, that you are not good people at all, that Jesus makes us good. And so when Christ loves us and we receive that love and we've encountered the gospel, our response is then to give our lives to what he's asking us to do. Um, sometimes I used to have, I don't, I don't really anymore, when you have seven children, you just, you don't have insomnia, it doesn't happen. Like, I've never, I feel like I'm sick, like really old, I was about to give a number. Um, I've learned not to do that. Uh, when I was as old as Lynn, one of our elders, um, you know, I, that's why I feel like sometimes because I, 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 I wanna go to bed super early now because, you know, Cassie and I have seven children and as soon as like the last one's asleep, like it's a race to the bed. You know, and it's not romantic, it's who can get there first to get the good side and go to sleep, all right? I mean, we're out, okay? And so, um, but used to, before all these children came, did anybody ever used to uh, stay up late and, and you would see the infomercials that came on, like late at night? Billy Zane here, and you know, and he would like sell you whatever you didn't need, right, yeah? The shot, that's why, I mean, I mean, my early age, you know, Cassie and I, we, we were sitting there early in our marriage and there was like something like some kind of uh, apple core thing that like if you got it and it just poked through the apple and the core shot out. And she's like, we need that. I'm like, why do we need that? Aren't you allergic to apples? Like what, but it's so cool. And, and, and the thing is, and we bought it and it's sitting here in our kitchen to this day, never used it once. <laughs> That's not a sermon on impulsive buying or a you know, dictation of my wife, but you can pray for her. Um, it's okay, she's here this morning. So I'm even misbehaving when she's here. It's the pain meds. Um, Here's the thing. So I, 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 the most ridiculous one though I saw was um, a fruit protector, okay? All right? They, would, they were selling this, this little thing that was like circle, it, it, it could be molded to the fruit that you were trying to protect. And one of the fruit, they're like, and look at this orange. And I'm going, wait, 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 what? Doesn't orange come naturally with protection? <laughs> the thing is, if you look for it. My, my favorite one is right now, you, there's actually a, a place in Springfield where you can call and they'll go get your fast food for you and bring it to you. Let that sink in for a minute. 
You worried about our politicians and who's gonna be the next president? You should worry about that right there. Okay. But we love comfort. We wanna be satisfied. And unfortunately, and I say this time and time again, I think I say this every Sunday, but unfortunately a lot of us grew up with the understanding that if we knew Jesus and we were Christians, that life was gonna work out perfectly. That if we just love God really a whole bunch, that we'll never face any kind of trials or tribulations. And the reality is that many of you may be here this morning has been fooled by that and whenever things don't work out like that, who do you get angry with? I mean, you're like, God, what's up? You promised me. No, God promised you life in Christ. Your life on its own promised you death and separation. God has given us all we need in Christ and anything else is just icing on the cake of life. The reality is when I became a follower of Christ, things got more difficult because then I knew good from bad, wrong from right. It is not easy being a Christian, but it's joyful, it's fulfilling, and it makes us complete. But when we face adversity, no matter how many times God has acted in our lives, we have a tendency to sometimes go after the hard idol of comfort, of security. And we're gonna look at that here this morning. Exodus chapter 16, we're gonna jump all around today. Again, this is not my style. Usually I just camp out in a passage and we just stay there forever. But um, like I said, we're not going line by line through Exodus, so just um, bear with me. Um, Exodus chapter 16, the people of Israel, they have been saved from, from Egypt. God has delivered them from the Egyptians. Uh, he has now sent them to a path that will take them eventually to the promised land. They've been in the wilderness for a while. And here's where it starts out. It says, they set out from Elam and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So they've been out like eight weeks. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat post and ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in the law or not. So a couple of things here. The Egyptians, all they knew was death and slavery back in Egypt. And God did amazing things. He sent plagues, he sent miracles, he sent signs, he sent Moses, freed them from slavery. They got out of captivity and they had to face an ocean. God's like, no, no, I got this. He parts the ocean. They get across the other side. They've been, so this is post seeing like, you know, Shamu up front, right? Like they walked through the Red Sea and got to see Shamu up front. That doesn't just happen every day. Then when they get on the other side, the Egyptians go to follow them and God crushes them, bringing the ocean back. They've only been six to eight weeks post that time. They find themselves in the wilderness and what do they do? They're grumbling again. They literally are saying, it would be better to be back in slavery because at least we got bread, water, and food. Now here's the thing. You may think, well that's crazy, that's ridiculous. Why can't Israel just realize that they were in a bad situation? Why can't we sometimes? Some of us, we have known Christ for years, but we have that pet sin, that pet idolatry, and it just feels comfortable to go to that sin whenever times get bad. Can I tell you? So they were facing hunger. They were starving. They were were needing food. And that is the moment when we face adversity that we lose our faith in God to provide. And we just think it would just be so much better back then. It was so much easier back then because we desire to be served. And here's the thing, we want God's blessings, but we want it on our terms. And God's like, like, look, look what I've done. Look what I keep doing for you. Don't you trust me? It'll be on my terms that I bless you. And I promise you God's terms is so much better than ours. But here are these people, his people, that he saw do amazing things, who he passed over their sins and and freed them from the Egyptians. 
And they're sitting there grumbling against God going, like, like God is just gonna take them to the wilderness to kill them. And they're like, it'd be better to be under, hear this, masters and false gods that we could at least see and that provided right when we needed them to. And they grumbled. Our heart, we groan and we grumble and we complain to God when we face anxiety, the unknown, and, we beca- and I promise you, they're speaking out of fear. They're speaking solely out of fear. And we know fear is not of God. So what does God do? He talks to Moses. He says, look, I'm going to bring manna from heaven. I'm going to bring it to the people. And, and not only that, I'm going to test them. Now, the word law here at the very end, it says, and, and, uh, that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Okay, we think law as we think in like maybe even the Ten Commandments or we think law as in legalities of, of, you know, of, of judicial you know, means. That, that's actually a, a poor rendering of the Hebrew. And what he's trying to say here in law, he is testing the people to see if they're ready to be his people. That's what he's testing them. So the story plays out, and we don't have time to go through it, but the story plays out every morning for six days during the week, he provides manna. They go and they collect just enough for one day's worth. They go and they'll collect it and they have enough food for that day. On the sixth day, he says, okay, now tell the people to collect twice as much, twice as much for two days. So that's what they do. And on the seventh day, you're supposed to rest. It's a day of Sabbath. And we find out later that the people on the sixth day, yes, they, they collect both for, for enough for two days. And then on the seventh day, they go out again and go to collect. And they find that the manna is eaten up with worms and mold and decay. God is testing them and they continue to fail the test. He's like, I will provide for you. You don't, you don't have to manipulate your circumstances and you don't have to go and disobey my law or my commandments and, and really just be an affront to my righteousness in order to be provided for. But just like Israel, just like us, we're preachers of comfort. And we toil and we plan. And, and the thing is, here, look, I'm not saying that you need to wake up tomorrow morning and be like, Lord, do I need to go to work today or not? Give me a sign. (laughs) Look, bro, go to work, okay? Go to work. I got to, so do you. But what I am saying is, we often let our circumstances dictate our faithfulness, which then ultimately leads to whether we're gonna be happy or not. We allow finite situations to determine whether or not we are gonna have joy and trust and faith in God. You know, you know why it's so popular to be under the teaching of the false teaching and gospel of if you just love Jesus, everything's gonna work out, you're gonna have health, wealth, and prosperity. You know why it's so popular? Because what, not, what is not appealing about that? You can control your situation. If this morning I let, I, I help a little old lady across the street, okay, If I go feed the the hungry, if I'm nice to my kids, if I'm nice to my spouse, then God will love me. And if things don't happen the way I want to happen, then that just means that day I wasn't good enough. So I just need to be better tomorrow. So you're dictating your future, your present, your faithfulness on you and not the one who saved you. You can control it. So that's why everyone loves that because you can have some pragmatic steps to a better life. There is one pragmatic step to a better life and that's life in Christ. That's the only step you need. He is everything that we will ever need. He is our provision and everything else that we are granted here in this life, it's just like I said, icing on the life of, on the cake of life. That's all it is. I love cake, I use it a lot. And here are these people who have seen the wonders of God happened. They were called out and cried out to God and God heard their cry and delivered them from slavery. Like you and I called out to God and asked us, deliver us from sin. And he sent Jesus and that's exactly what happened. And yet they still doubt that God loves them, that God will be faithful to them. Now look, there are hard seasons that all of us go through and our faith will be shaky. That's fine. I get that. Like I get that. Like that's you being human. All right. That's okay. I'm allowing you to say, God, I don't like this. You can do that, okay? Is everybody, where's your, I will tell God when I don't like it. You promised me to do that? That's okay for you to talk to God like that because you're his kids. And he will comfort you and he will show you in his timing what he has for you. 
So quit gathering extra anxiety to, to prepare for the day of woe. Just live for today, live for now. That doesn't mean don't prepare, doesn't mean don't save. That doesn't mean I'm saying in your heart, in your emotions, in your mind, with your love, just be faithful and know that he's gonna be there to provide the manna you need for that day. Work hard, rest well, Sabbath, knowing that God, here's the thing, you are about to get into a political season of elections where you're gonna see on social media all the time like, if so-and-so wins, the world will come to an end. You know what? Every generation in every presidential election, people have been saying that. We still hear. I just wanna tell all everybody, all, I, and I love politics, just like the next person. I taught it for seven years in college. But everybody, we need to chill. That's a, that's a Greek word. That's a Greek word for you. There's a couple of verses one says in Psalm 132, God is in the heavens and on his thrones and he does as he pleases. Another one is Psalm 134 says, and the kings of the world are like channels of water in my hand. I dictate and move them how I will. Whoever wins in November, that's God's doing. And tomorrow will come and we're gonna wake up and guess what? We'll have a new president, but we'll have the same mission. And that is to love people and tell them about Jesus to make disciples. And the world is gonna keep getting worse and worse and worse. I promise you it will because this is not heaven. But we, as believers in Christ, who have hope beyond hope, will raise our heads and go, we will not fall back to the comfort of idle, just stagnant. We're not gonna say, okay, fine, I'm just gonna go in my hole and I'm just gonna be comfortable here, I don't wanna go out there. No, engage, engage your neighbors, engage your friends, engage your family with Christ. Let them know of the provision that you have been provided through Jesus. John, let's give it up here in a minute. I think it's John chapter six. Jesus is talking in verse 30, and he says this. So they said to him, then, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? So, so here's again, it hasn't changed. This is hundreds of years later. People still have it, they just want signs and wonders from God so they will believe. They need proof because that's comforting. It's comforting to see faith where you can tangibly see it. He says, well, what do, you, what do you need? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses. See, they were letting Moses be the champion here. He's the one who provided the manna. See, after all these years, they had mixed up the story. He says, no, 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 Moses didn't give you anything. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is to be who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Still thinking it's gonna be tangible manna like their ancestors, the Israelites, were gathering on all those six days. And he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall not thirst. Christ is beckoning us to get out of our comfort zone, to get out where he is calling us to be, knowing that we will be filled, not by the results of our life, but by what he did on the cross. That's where our fulfillment comes. That's where we won't be hungry anymore. Can I tell you, some of you, I believe, and because I, I was there, I was there for so many years, I was so dissatisfied with my faith, because I kept on trying to add to Jesus. And I would tell God all the time, because I wanted his blessings, but I wanted them on my timeline. God, I will super serve you, like I'm just serving you kind of right now, I'll really serve you. If you give me a, a really cute looking wife, bam, did it. He's like, look, I'll help you out punch your coverage, like big time. When Cassie said yes on that first date, I was like, will you marry me? No true story, within two weeks of us dating, I was like, I love you, and her response was, thank you. She's a wise woman. But then I told her I'd be rich, and she was like, oh, no, that wasn't that time ago. She said, I have potential. She likes a project. <laughs> and I remember telling God, if you would just give me influence, a stage, a ministry, do you know how effective I could be? If you would just give me a house, I've never owned a house in my life, 35 years old, never owned a house before. That's just ministry. And I ask the Lord all the time, if you would just do this, 
that I would finally serve you. And and it's taken a long time, but I finally realized that Christ has given me everything and I shall never go hungry again because the bread of life, it was within me. Fast forward a few years and, and you have the people of Israel now uh, Moses has gone to Mount Sinai. They, they've, they've headed um, past the wilderness somewhat. Uh, he came down with 10 commandments and, and he said, I'm gonna make you a priesthood of believers. But Moses then goes up and he, and he goes to talk to God and the people do something really foolish. Let, let's look, Exodus uh, chapter 32. <clears throat> it says this, when the people say that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves to gather sorry, 32, one through 14, I apologize, together to Aaron and said to them, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and they brought them to Aaron and he received the gold from the hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf and they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now, now a few things. I don't know how long Moses was gone, all right? But I'm assuming that it must have been, it, I, I, for their sake and for their defense, it must have been a while. But immediately when the mouthpiece of God who had been talking on God's behalf was delaying in his time, the people run back to their idols. And here's the thing. It wasn't like, well, Moses put us in a circumstance. That was inside them already. I mean, we have minor prophets and major prophets throughout the Bible going, like reminding the people years after the Exodus, saying, put away your gods from Egypt. Put away your gods. Put away your gods. The people continually want to go to the tangible. They continually want to go to things that they can touch and things that they can see and things that they can, you know, interact with. And here's the thing I think we don't do a lot. We deny our access to God all the time. We don't, we, we, do you realize if you're a believer in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. The Holy Spirit is engaging with the Father on your behalf constantly. Jesus says, and my Father in chapter 10 of John says, he's gonna send a helpmate to remind you of all the things that I've said. But as soon as they began to worry and be anxious, the people of Israel then fashioned for themselves an idol, things that was comfortable to them that they could see and bring them satisfaction. Despite God delivering them from Egypt, taking them through the Red Sea, providing manna. We didn't read this part, but a water from a rock, which is hard to do, okay? And here they are, like like children, impatient, going, well, he must have left us. Or maybe, maybe, it never was him, but we will fashion this God for us to deliver us out of Egypt. You know when you know that you've engaged in idolatry? which quite honestly, I think the root of every single sin that we ever commit is idolatry. You're usually, and it's usually the worship of ourselves. Idolatry is when you put something before God in a couple of ways. Number one, you say, if I don't have this in my life, then I can't be happy. That's an idol for you. If I don't have this in my life, if God doesn't give me this in my life, then I, and here's the thing, it could be good things. If I don't find a spouse, then I will never be happy. No, finding a spouse is a good thing, right? Husbands, this is your chance. Yes, this is, it's a great thing. I love you, dear. I mean, I mean, softballs, guys, softballs. I'm just trying to help you out. But as much as I love my wife, she doesn't complete me. We're not Jerry Maguire. I'm like, that doesn't, mm mm-mm. She's great. She's an amazing mother, an amazing helpmate. I could not have asked for a better wife. She's, she's absolutely beautiful inside and out. But, but Cassie is not my salvation. Well, if I just had kids, and, and, I, and, and parent, being parent is, is a great thing, you know. But, but kids won't complete you. You won't like arrive to adulthood if you get kids, right? 
through either having them or adopting them or whatever, it won't complete you. If I just had this job, if God, you just give me this job, then, then it would, I would finally be able to, it's an idol. It's just an idol. You can also identify idols often because they're usually things that you are trying to manipulate and craft yourself. Look here, give me your goal and let me craft it. Okay, there's your God. But the Lord was not fashioned by human hands. Christ was not manifest because you and I willed it. He is no idol to be trifled with. He is the Lord God, Yahweh, Jehovah Jireh. But our idols, you can always point them out pretty quickly because they're usually things that we've crafted, either in our mind, our heart, or with our hands. If you, if you read on, let, let's, let's keep going on here. If you, if you read on, he says, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron, now Aaron is like Jesus' brother, right? He's his number two. He's been there from the very beginning. Dude would be fired on my staff. I'm just straight up. I can't even fire people, but anyway. When Aaron saw this, Dan, don't pull an Aaron. He built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast of the Lord. What Lord? The one they just crafted. And they rose up early in the next day and they offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Not only had they gone to idol worship, they were now comfortable. They were so freaked out that Moses wasn't here. But then when they finally carve out an idol for themselves that makes them feel comfortable, that they can see, that they can touch, that they can interact with, then this is they play. They have a good time. They have a festival. They have a feast. They're partying. Here's our God. The one like, look, things strike me funny in the Bible. And this is totally probably not your sense of humor, but can, can, can I go somewhere real quick? Are you good with that? I ain't part of the sermon. It's extra. So you're welcome. <laughs> can you imagine some of this gold? Like, like people who are taking off their gold, like what if it was the stuff that turns your, your ears green? Psh, yeah, you can have these earrings. My mother-in-law gave them to me. They were terrible. And, you know, <laughs> I doubt they gave their best, Right? You know, they know what's made of that gold, right? Yeah, that, that crook, the millers next door, they sold us this junk. Yeah, you can have that. Based on that idol. Okay, and they watched it be melted down, right? Okay, and then they crafted it into a cow. Now, theologians, they have all kinds of debates on what this calf was. Was it one of the gods of Egypt that they had interacted? Was it uh, culturally relevant to them because that was, you know, cattle was considered a, a bringer of life through milk, through meat, through whatever? I, I don't know. But a cow? And here they are with their gold celebrating and saying, this thing that I Create it will deliver me and has delivered me. And it sounds crazy, but how many things have you and I crafted in our lives that we think will deliver us? How many things have you and I melted down to its core and go, that's my salvation? There's only one who saves, and that's Jesus. And I, my, my, my greatest heartache is that you would toil your entire life thinking that other things are gonna get you out of your situation of your separation between you and God. And the thing is, the church can be that too. Did you know that? The church can be an idol. Oh, pastor, you don't understand. Every Sunday morning, I'm volunteering, I'm cleaning up, the church doors are open, I'm there. I mean, I'm there all the time. Thank God, praise God, I'm glad you're here. I mean, I mean you know, I've, I've had, not here in this church, thankfully, but in past churches, you have people that, they'll sign up everything, you know, it'd be like, we're, we're, we're on gum detail from kids who put gum underneath the seats. Sign me up. I'll be minister of the gum detail. I mean, they're ready, right? And no matter what job they're doing, because they believe that if they perform, they believe if they're here around the church, they believe if they keep doing things that look religious, that they will become saved. We, hear this, hear this, because then you're like, well, I don't have to serve now. No. My elders back there like, where are you going? Here I'm going, all right, we don't serve God, we don't love God, and we don't love other people in order to receive his blessings. We received his blessings in Christ and a response from feeling everything we need in Jesus, we serve, we love, and we encounter other people. The church is here 
for the broken, for the wounded, and for those who need help. And those of us, many of us, myself included, who are just simple rebels, clinging to the mercies of Jesus daily. But it can be our idol if we're not. So why do you serve? Why do you engage? Why do you love? It has to come from the source of the gospel. And I can't think of a better time in our history right now since I've been alive that we could use not more people who love like that. Oftentimes, we will try so hard to create this idol for everyone else to see in our lives that says, this is who we are, look how great we are, look how righteous we are, our perfect little family. Look here, I'm gonna be straight with you. When I'm coming to church and I have my kids with me, before I can even get on stage, I gotta do a lot of repenting. It's amazing, they'll be fine all week and then Sunday morning in the car, that's when the wheels come off. <laughs> you kids better stop it. And you get out of the car and you're like, hi, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so. I mean, yeah, right? People ask me, they go, what, what do you think about before you get on, on stage? Uh, literally, like this is literally what happens. I'll, I'll tell you what happened. This is my secret, so don't tell anybody. Hashtag, I got the rights to this, okay? I'm gonna sell no books on me. I'm worshiping, and I feel like I can't do this. And I think about my sin for the week. And by the next step, I'm repenting. Next step, I'm receiving grace. Next step, I'm saying, Lord, please, 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 and Cassie's word, I'm gonna run into something. I'm not, I got it, girl. And I'm like, Lord, I can't, I don't have the words. Next step, Lord, give me the words. And you know what I say every single time before I get on the stage? Lord, let it be you and not me that they see. That's the process. That's literally the process I make. And my wife knows it's true because she's with me all week. It's that moment where we're like, I'm encountering the grace of of God through Jesus and his mercy so the idols of my heart can be absolutely destroyed even the ones that I've crafted with my hands that I have put in my own life. Now God's mad and he says, and the Lord said to Moses, because he, you know, he's God, he can see all this happening, you know, right? And he says, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt. Now God, <laughs> I mean, he's like turned the table. He's like, you brought them out, not me. You brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods. O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Next slide. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people and behold, it is a stiff necked people. That's a whole nother sermon. We don't have time. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation out of you. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt? Now see what Moses did? See what he did there? He's, a, he's acknowledging. He said, Lord, I didn't do anything. So Moses was being tested even in this conversation. Oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, the great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent to bring them out to kill them in the, in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. And God does. God sends Moses back down to wreck shop. Now here's the significance here. God was ready to like, like do like a Noah's Ark Genesis thing on these folks. Like we starting over again. And Moses interceded. Now, Moses didn't change God's mind, okay? This is all God's will and he's testing Moses and he's putting it out and kind of just unfolding his plan of redemption through and through. And it's again, another layer of seeing, are these people ready to be my people? Are they ready to be my kingdom of priests? Are they ready? And so Moses intercedes for them and God spares them even when they were worshiping idols, despite what God had done for them. Don't miss the significance here. You can sit there and go, well, I mean, if I was there in Israel, I'd be like the one voice going, we probably shouldn't do this. Romans says, when you were sinners, Christ died for you. 
you were enemies of God, Romans 1. And Jesus, though we worshiped idols because of our sin nature, interceded on our behalf. The righteous judge, God the Father Almighty, had every reason to not redeem us, yet Christ intercedes. And when he sees you now on the opposite side of the gospel, when you have believed in Christ, he doesn't see your idol worship, he doesn't see any of that, he sees his son, his daughter, who he is well pleased. Because he's well pleased with his son who saved you and me. Quickly, I wanna read two more verses to you and then I'm done, I promise. Ezekiel 36, starting in verse 24. God's talking to the prophet Ezekiel and says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And hear this, don't miss this. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you and I will remove the heart of the stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. I really, really believe God loves you. And you have value. And when he sees you, I know some of you think, well, he just sees this idol worshiper, this complainer. And he may look down and go, I mean, like, like, serious? And you may even have issues from your own father in the past. And it's even creeping up right now in your relation with God. And you're just like, God's just really disappointed in me. He wants more out of me. God loves you so much that he sent his only son to die for you. And here's the thing. When Israel wanted comfort, they fashioned for themselves idols. They made them. What does God say here in Ezekiel? I, I will cleanse you. I will put a new heart within you and take out the heart of stone. I will put my spirit within you. I will will have you obey my statutes and my commands. I will be your God. When it's all said and done, the author and perfecter of your faith is the Lord and you have done nothing to get to the point where you're at. I know a lot of us, our own idols are ourselves and we just are depending on ourselves to get us out of situations. We get real comfortable with the idea that we can control our destiny. And look, I'm not saying you dream big, dream big, work hard. Do things, things that you never thought were possible. Take risk, but know that everything that you're given in life was given by the great I am. I am your God, you are my people. You notice the hero of this passage isn't you. I think for a lot of us too, we just try our best to try to kind of craft our salvation based on our works. And God says, no, it's me. I am the one who begins it. I'm the one who ends it. And I'm the one in between. And what's amazing about that is our salvation has nothing to do with us. And that should make us cry out, amen. That should make you and I, we should just stop right now. That statement right there should make us worship. Because I promise you, you don't want it to be about you and based on you. I don't want it to be based on me. I want God to say, well, let me measure Kyle's life and see if he's worthy to be my son. I know me and I know what I've done. I know what I do and I know what I'm gonna do. But yet he holds back his wrath from me because he has given me a new heart. He has taken away my heart of stone. He has placed his spirit within me. You have nothing to do with your salvation, yet you get to benefit from all of it. You just simply have to believe. Let me end you with this passage in Titus. We never go to Titus. You know? Like if I had like a Bible drawer right now, like, hey, go to Titus, you'd be like, that's, yeah, Old Testament. 
That's why you need to join Awanas. That's why you need to help the kids with Bible drill. It's not embarrassing. You can learn with them. I think they were telling us like at the end of the Awanas, they should have learned like 164 verses or something like that. Like amen to that, right? Yeah. So volunteer, sign up, connect card right now. I'll wait. No, I won't. Titus says this, and I'll end with this. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out in us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I don't even have to preach that, man. He saved us, not because of your works. So tear down your idols. Ask God to melt them away. I know it is so tempting to want God's blessings the way you want them and when you want them right then. And it's so tempting to try to do it yourself and to build for you things that will make you comfortable but back away from those idols and realize that there is nothing under the sun that you can do that's gonna save you. It's Christ. And for those of you who've been saved by Christ, quit trying to add to him. Man, here in a little bit, we're just gonna be, we're gonna worship, we're gonna take the Lord's Supper and I'm, 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 I just want you to back up and go, look, what, what am I doing? What have I crafted with my own hands? What have I tried to manifest in my life? What am I grumbling about that God hasn't given me? What are the things that I am not recognizing that I am trying to do to save me? And I want you to step back and I just want you to preach the gospel to yourself. I just want you to go like, look, he has saved me. Not because of what I've done. Not because of my righteousness, but according to his own mercy. That's why God allowed the people to live after they built the idol after they erected the golden calf. The reason why he left is because his mercy. The reason why I'm able to sit on this, stand on this stage and hobble around and tell you about the gospel is because of his mercy. I didn't earn this position. It's because of his grace and his mercy. The reason why you are who you are, where you're at with the family that you have and the job that you have, the influence that you have, and the fact that you and I got to wake up this morning and breathe the free air of the gospel is because of his mercy. And hear this, last thing I'll say, it is a lot clearer picture that you can see of Jesus and God and his will when you don't have an idol standing in front of you. And so ask him to crush it. Get out of your comfort zone. Take that first step. And know that he has given you the heart of flesh that pumps for him. And is much more comfortable to be in the will of God than anything that we can manifest for ourselves. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that we have created idols, that we have tried to receive blessings on our own timing. Father, will you just remind us this morning of what you've done and who you are. Remind us of Jesus and the gospel. And Lord, for those of this morning that just have yet to take that first step in faith, would you give them the faith in which to believe in Christ? Will you tear down the idols that may be in their heart? and allow your glory and your mercy and your salvation to shine. We ask all this, we beg you for salvation to reign here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.